Okay, without any wasting any time, uh, let me invite uh, Ricardo Manzotti. Are you here, Ricardo? Donald is first. Oh, good. So, Donald, please join me. But Ricardo should be here to listen to Don. Okay. 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 So I met Donald Hoffman, whom you just heard, brilliant lecture, um, many years ago now. Uh, he's been a great, uh, a great speaker at some of our conferences at the Center on Sages and Scientists. Actually, he's the winner of an award that mm -hmm. the Chopra Foundation gives for original thinking. And um, I have to say, I'm a huge fan of yours, Don. Thank you. So um, let me ask you a few questions. I heard your lecture, which is new for me, by mm -hmm. the way. Um, me too. So, <laughs> so now, um, you, me, this table, all the objects here, this space that we're in, the time we started, and now, these are all icons on a desktop. That's right. Space itself, which we naturally think of as the pre-existing stage on which the drama of life plays out, is just your desktop. It's just a data format that we use that evolution, for example, has built into us as a way to um, hide the truth and to give us eye candy like physical objects, the table, the chair, the glass of water. Physical objects are simply eye candy that describes fitness opportunities for us. And then who or what is a conscious agent? So um, in, informally, the idea of a conscious agent is, is actually quite simple. A conscious agent can have a range of experiences, like colors and tastes and smells, Based on those experiences, it can make decisions, free will decisions, about actions that it can take. And it, so it has a set of possible actions, and those actions affect the world, and then the world comes back and affects the perceptions. And so what we, we take that very simple idea, which if you, you, know, if you think about it that way, you go, well, well, how could you argue with that? Yeah, we have experiences, we make decisions, we act. But, but all we do in this theory of conscious agents is make that mathematically precise, and then we can prove interesting theorems. We, we, our, our mathematical model of consciousness turns out to be computationally universal. It, so anything, any model in cognitive science about memory, attention, learning, problem solving, can actually be remodeled in the language of these conscious agents. It's, it's a theorem. And what we're working on now is to show how we could take the mathematics of conscious agents and boot up space and time, boot up modern physics and create objects coming out of it as just forms of the conscious experiences of these agents. So space-time is just one of the forms of experience of some conscious agents. It's not a pre-existing condition, it's a kind of experiential format that an agent can evolve. This body-mind, that body-mind and all these body-minds are reflections of a deeper reality which you're calling conscious agents. That's right. That's exactly right. And that right. deeper reality which you're calling conscious agents yes. is immaterial. Exactly. It's outside of space and time. It's outside of space and time. That's right. It's, it creates space and time. It's timeless. Absolutely. It's, it's completely so timeless. So when we say outside of space and time, we're not talking about eternal duration in time. No. We're talking about no time at all. That's right. The very category of time is the wrong category. Mm -hmm. So then, can we, for some of us simpler people, <laughs> uh, say that the conscious agent is um, uh, the ontological primitive that evokes experience? That, that's right. And again, this is um, a scientific hypothesis. So I could be wrong. In fact, I'm probably wrong. But the idea is to make this idea so precise that we can then find out precisely where it's wrong. So the idea is, let's see, here's how I could be wrong. Suppose that I have this mathematical model of conscious agents and I cannot use it to boot up general relativity, 
and quantum field theory and Darwinian evolution. Suppose I can't do that, then I'm wrong. It's just plain, flat out, I'm wrong. So what I have to do is get back our current scientific theories. So I'm not throwing away our current scientific theories. By, by no means, they're wonderful tools. I have to recover general relativity. I have to recover quantum field theory and also Darwinian evolution as a representation of the conscious agent dynamics when it's projected back into the space-time interface of Homo sapiens. That's, that's the constraint on my theory. So, so this means that my theory of spirituality has really tight constraints. It starts off with intuitions, experiences, decisions, actions, mathematize, and then the question is, can I get back all of modern science? If I can't, then I'm wrong. There's something that needs to be fixed. And so that's the cycle. So it's, it's not, so in, in one sense, you know, I'm challenging modern scientific ideas, but on the other hand, I know that I have to get back those modern scientific ideas as the limits of my new theory. If I don't get them back, I'm wrong. I question that. Why okay. do you say that? Why do you say that? Because science is only a method of inquiry, right? Science is a methodology, and you, you put out the principles of the methodology. Right. But science itself is an activity mm -hmm in the conscious agent that we're calling Don Hoffman right now, right? Science <laughs> observations are made in that conscious agent. Theories are conceived in that conscious That's agent. Right. Experiments are designed by that conscious agent. That's right. So when you say I, who or what are you referring to? Well, first on, on the first part of your question. So mm -hmm. why do I insist that I need to get back these, these theories? When you look at a theory um, like Einstein's general relativity or quantum field theory or something like that. And you can write it down with just, you know, on a sheet of paper really quickly. An what equation. That, some, yeah, or a set of equations. What those equations really capture are thousands of careful experiments that many people have done where they look, they set up very, very precise situations, they make careful measurements, and they thought really hard, how can I explain this pattern of observations that I'm getting? And when you write down, like, general relativity, it explains a ton of observations. And so... And now we have gravity waves the, to prove And we that. now have gravity waves. So, so the reason why any scientist, not just me, any, any scientist would say, if I'm going to come up with a new theory, like the theory of quantum gravity, it better give me back general relativity as a limit because we have so much good evidence for that. If I violate that evidence, I've pretty much violated thousands of experiments. So that's why we were very, very careful okay. to be conservative uh, that way. So just based on that, where did those equations come from? Um, well, it's a very human enterprise. Right? So if you read the story about how Einstein came up with general relativity, right? he was struggling for years, and it was a very emotional enterprise that went on for many, many years, and he thought he had the right equations, and he tried to convince him he, himself he had the right ones, but then things didn't quite work out right. And it, and it was only you know, in, in November of 1915 when he had to give a talk. <laughs> and he had to present the stuff that he really finally converged and got the talk. Well, he gave four talks. The first one he gave a theory, and the next one he said, that's wrong, here's why. And then the next, but here's how to fix it. Then the, next, the third talk he said, well, the other one was wrong, here's how to fix that. And then finally on the fourth one he said, I've got the equations. And they were the equations that actually worked. So it's a very human enterprise, but it's really capturing in a precise language a whole vast array of experiments that have been done. That's the power, it's like a data compression thing. Here's, instead of telling you a thousand experiments, I can say all these experiments can be accounted by this one line equation. Yeah, but my question is a little deeper. <coughs> Where does mathematics exist? Where do, do equations exist right. uh, before they crop up in, say, Einstein's consciousness? Yeah, I think that mathematics is going to be part of the fundamental apparatus of consciousness. That, um, the, that by proposing that conscious agents actually themselves have a mathematical structure, I'm actually proposing that mathematical structure is not divorced from the fundamental conscious reality, that conscious reality itself is, is structured, and that the right language for describing that structure 
is mathematics. Again, it's a fallible hypothesis, but what you do is you say, let's be bold, let's be precise, let's see where it goes. You said human adventure, so yes. what we're describing now, what you're describing is the human universe, yes. right? Yes, that's right. And um, when you were talking about uh, evolution hides the truth, yes. right? Would you be willing to consider, in your framework, mm -hmm. the idea that the evolution of species is actually the evolution of species of consciousness? Yes, I think that I, I would agree completely. <clears throat> From my point of view, the fundamental dynamic is an evolution of consciousness. And the question is first to write down, what is that, what are the equations of the dynamic, if we can, and then to show that when we look at that dynamic and project it into our space-time interface, we get, for example, in one aspect of it, what looks like the evolution of species. That's what it looks like within our interface. So it's, it's, and, but, but all of physical dynamics is going to be the same thing. Even the interaction of um, atoms in a molecule will have to ultimately be cashed out as the interactions of conscious agents viewed through our little interface. Would you then also, since you use the word atoms and molecules, mm -hmm. are they actually real things or are they human constructs in human consciousness? There, there are modes of knowing and experience. There, there are modes of knowing and experience. And there's a very specific testable claim that you can make to, that scientists can check this on. That is, the claim is that no fundamental particle electron or quark, has definite values of any dynamical physical property like position, momentum, spin, when it's not observed. Clean, pretty. If that's wrong, then I'm wrong. It's just that simple. If physical so, objects have definite values of properties when they're not observed, I'm plain wrong. So um, an atom, a molecule, a gluon, right. a, exactly. a boson, that's right. Higgs boson, a exactly galaxy, right. a star, right. a human body, a brain, That's right. um, right. even a mind is a mode of knowing and experience in consciousness. That, that, that's right. They're, they're all modes of consciousness. And I, I would just say on the, the atoms and quarks and so forth, that all the experiments done by physicists so far um, show that the idea of local realism is false that properties exist and don't propagate faster than the speed of light, that's false. Local realism is false. And also non-contextual realism is false. The idea that particles have properties independent of how you measure them. Those have both been tested numerous times and they are false. So that's the, the, independent of whether quantum mechanics is, is correct. Is all realism false? Well, uh, the interesting thing is I am a scientific realist. Um, but but well, that takes us even deeper down the the, the, the rabbit hole, rabbit right? Hole, right? So uh, for those of us, you know, there are a lot of people who don't know these terms. I'm sure a lot who do. Can we make distinctions between naive realism, representational realism, and scientific realism? Right. So so many scientists think that the goal of science or is to get theories that are closer and closer to true descriptions of objective reality. And I do share that hope. I do share that hope. But I'm also, as a scientist, very, very skeptical that any of my current theories have done that, right? So you, as a scientist, you're, I'm both wanting to get there and very suspicious that I haven't got there yet, right? And so that's the way I feel about space and time and matter. We thought that space and time and matter are fundamental and the quantum mechanical descriptions of them um, where matter is assumed to be fundamental, is a true final description of objective reality. And I think that's false. But, so when I propose conscious realism and say conscious agents are fundamental, I'm doing it as a realist. I'm proposing that this really is the case, that conscious agents are fundamental. But I'm, again, suspicious of my own theory. I mean, I'm, I'm probably wrong, but let's, let's take but it for a ride. But you're also saying fundamental reality is immaterial, right? Uh, that's what I'm saying, absolutely. <laughs> okay, so, um, you know, I recently went um, for a week of silence uh, yes. close by here. And uh, on the way back to home, I 
was, I had, uh, from my friend Punacha was driving, and silence was over, and we were looking at a tree. Yeah. And um, the thought occurred to me, is the tree, the look of it, or just my way of looking at it? And then the thought occurred that in the ecosystem that the tree is in, bees and birds and rabbits and snakes, if there were snakes, um, and other species, including insects with numerous eyes, yes. we're all looking at a different tree. Yes. So far, so good? Absolutely. And therefore, the tree that we were all looking at was a false tree. It was a symbol of a deeper reality. Right. And according to your theory, that is precisely why natural selection, in a way, favors non-truth. Because if we could all see everything, there would be no predator-prey relationship. Mm -hmm. There would be no ecosystem in which this whole play mm -hmm. of what I would say consciousness mm -hmm. is occurring. So in a sense, that tree and its ecosystem is all basically conscious agents seeing their version of a tree. That, that, that's right. And I, there's a couple of things that, so I agree with you on that. There's a couple of ways to think about this that I think really help to see it. That you could have a, a space-time physical perception, but behind it there's a much deeper conscious reality. And you can see that every time you look in the mirror. When you look at yourself in the mirror, you see, what do you see? You see skin, hair, eyes. But you know firsthand that what you see in the mirror is literally just skin deep. Behind that is your goals, your aspirations, your love of music, your desire for, for meaning in life. There's a whole rich world of your conscious experiences, and all you can see in the mirror, all anybody else can see, is skin deep. So we, here's a case where your interface, your face is the, the symbol on the interface, is, you know, it's, it's good. When you smile, I can figure out you're happy. When you frown, I can figure out maybe you're not happy. So I get some insight into that rich conscious world behind the interface, but it's far richer than the interface. And another point that you brought up, I think that I agree, in some sense the interface is there because objective reality is infinitely complicated. I have only finite resources. So my interface has to give up on basically almost everything. And the part that I don't give up on, I better use really dumbed down symbols because otherwise I'm going to be spending all my time, you know, it's just going to be too much for me. So what we do as humans is we, we, first we have to have a dumbed down simplified universe uh, interface because we can't deal with the complexity. But then we make this interesting mistake. We assume that limits of our interface are really an insight into objective reality. We mistake our limits, which are necessary because we have to deal with finite interfaces or we'd be overwhelmed. So all these limits, so I look at a rock, it doesn't look alive. And so I assume that it's completely, that there's nothing animate, that I'm not interacting with anything animate. What I'm saying is that rock is a dumbed down symbol because I've given up. So when I look at you, I have some, my interface gives me some insight into you as a conscious being. I can have some insight into your emotions and your mood and your thoughts. When I talk, interact with a cat, a little bit less. With an ant, a lot less. By the time I get to a rock and an atom, my interface has given up. It's just completely given up, giving me any insight into the nature of consciousness that, that is trying to represent behind it. So, so, so that's the limit of our interface, and we reify the limits of our interface and assume that's the nature of objective reality. And I, I do want to say that I'm not saying that a rock is conscious. That's panpsychism. It's an experience in consciousness. A rock is an experience in consciousness that's the best that I can come up with because of my limited interface as I interact with a realm of conscious agents. But that realm is so complicated that eventually I give up and I come up with things like rocks and atoms. And that's the best I can do. So, how many people in this room have a dog or a cat? <clears throat> you have relationships with these conscious agents? Yes? Yeah. 
Does a dog perceive the same world that you and I perceive when a dog barks? Does it hear the same sound that you and I hear? I think that their perceptual worlds are very, very different from ours. Uh, and so that what we take for granted as um, the truth about objective reality could be very, very different for them. I'll give you an example. Um, there are some women who have four cone photoreceptors instead of three. Most of us have only three photoreceptors. But there are certain women with a genetic mutation who have four. And when you do careful experiments, they're called tetrafems. These women actually have a new dimension of color experience that no man has and most women don't have. And if I ask you to imagine a color, a specific color, that you've never seen before, does anything happen? Smoke comes out of my ears, but I can't get a concrete color. These women are living in a color world that I cannot even concretely imagine. And so, that, and that, that turns out to be just one letter of DNA difference between them and the rest of us. One letter. So, here's an interesting connection between one letter of DNA difference and a whole new world of color experiences that I can't even concretely imagine. But the mantis shrimp, this humble creature in the water, has 10 or 11. Right? So, who knows what kind of color world it's living in. Pigeons have four. I mean, Woody Allen called them rats with wings, but they actually have a, a richer color world than, than, than we have. And yet, going back to a simpler example, this is wonderful what you've just said, because it shows that what we call everyday reality is just an experience in a conscious agent. Absolutely. But you and I as conscious agents also have constructs, like mathematical constructs, yes. right? right? I'm sure, you know, I had the opportunity to think about this. I was watching a program um, with Obama's White House, yes. and Bo, his dog, mm -hmm. was sitting in the Oval Office. And it occurred to me that Bo had no idea that Obama was the President of the United <laughs> States, or what the Oval Office was. Okay, because that's a human creation, a human right. story, a human construct, as is mathematics, by the way, right, right. as a science. That's right. Okay? Absolutely. It's a story. Right. Uh, Absolutely. And, uh, Absolutely. And if you're embedded in that story, then at least for humans, whatever the story is, mythological or philosophical right. or religious or scientific, then that's what filters your perception of reality in many ways. That's right. And yet, if Obama stroked mm -hmm. his dog, he wagged his tail, if he stepped on the tail, mm -hmm. the dog would yelp. So right. there's some cross-species exchange yes. of what? Conscious experiences. So in, in the theory of conscious agents, the coin of the realm is going to be conscious experiences. And those can leak from one species to another. Absolutely. Because species itself is just an interface idea. It's idea. not the objective reality. It's just the way we... What we call reality is a symbol. It's just a symbol. That's right. And mathematics, which describes those symbols, is also symbols. Th that's right. And you're right that, w that science is storytelling, as is a lot of human. So we're inveterate storytellers. But what we've found is if you are very, very precise in your storytelling, you can predict. You, you, it makes a big, big difference. You can actually explain why those twin quasars are, in fact, the same quasar. If you weren't that precise, if you didn't use mathematics, you wouldn't have a prayer of doing that. So it's, we are storytelling, and we, we're probably wrong, but what we find is as we're precise, something magical happens. We get insights into consciousness and into our, who we are that we could not have gotten without mathematics doesn't mean that mathematics is absolutely right, but it's a good working hypothesis that it's a fabulous tool. So all of us now are on the interface, let's assume this is a computer, desktop, 3D, etc. Yeah. What's in the belly of the computer where the real action is? Well, from, from my... So I, as you're right, it's, it's all a story, but the story I'm proposing is that it's all consciousness, and the reason I propose that is it's possible that everything I believe is false. It's possible. It may be that everything that I've believed all my life is false. But if there's something that's true, it's that I have conscious experiences. 
that I have hopes, that I have feelings, that I have experienced colors. If I'm wrong about having conscious experiences, then it's pretty much game over. I mean, there's, there's really no point in trying to, I might as well have a beer and just relax and, you know, it's... Well, what's, what's in the belly of the computer? So it's conscious experiences then. So the, the point is, it, so, and, and I'm forced to that because it's sort of the, the only thing that I, if I let go of that, then I've let go of everything. So what I propose is conscious experiences and the agents that have them is the final reality, and then let's do some science. Let's make that mathematical. Let's see where it goes. Can we boot up general relativity? Can we boot up everything from that? So, so that's the idea. I start with conscious experiences because that sort of is the minimal thing that I can start with. Also because I've found that space-time and matter aren't the final reality. They can't be if we evolved and were shaped by natural selection. Right? So, so scientists have two deeply held beliefs. Space-time and physical matter are objective and that we evolved and were shaped by natural selection. But what I've done with Chaitan is to say, those two beliefs are in conflict. You can have one or the other, but not both. If we evolved and were shaped by natural selection, then the probability that physicalism is correct is zero. Now, they might both be wrong, and I think they're both wrong, actually. But both are wrong, not in a trivial sense. They're, they're wrong in the same way that Newton was not quite right and Einstein was better. It's not that Newton was flat out wrong, it's just that there is a deeper theory. So that's the way I feel about evolution. It's, it's not wrong in the sense that I think it's, that it's just nonsense. Absolutely not. It's a beautiful, powerful theory. And I better get it back when I have my theory of conscious agents as a limiting case. <clears throat> so in your talk, you keep, kept coming back to conscious experiences. Yes. Uh, which is all we can know, yeah. right? That's right. Um, but is there a distinction between consciousness or awareness per se and experience? Is there, do you make yes. a distinction? Actually, there's, in the mathematics, we do have the ability to make a distinction between pure awareness without content versus specific conscious experiences. And um, the, the idea is that we can have a, a measurable, it's, it's called a measurable space with sigma algebras on it. And it turns out, by playing with these measurable spaces and sigma algebras, you can actually cash out the idea of awareness without content, and then ever more refined notions of experience that can happen on that awareness. So, and then the dynamics of consciousness can actually be viewed as awareness refining all the different kinds of experiences, getting more and more detailed and um, differentiated conscious experiences. So it's part of the beauty of this mathematics that it allows you to make that distinction and to then see how experiences can evolve in a, in a beautiful way. So in that, in that uh, picture you showed with the airplane, with the engine underneath it. Yes, yes. So <laughs> when I, I didn't see the engine first yes. time, That's right. and then you pointed it out, and then I saw the engine. Was the engine in awareness, but not in experience, till you pointed it out? That's a, an interesting technical question that a lot of psychophysicists have been looking at. We, we, we know that we can easily set up situations where people are actually not the best judges of their own conscious experiences. That a lot of our beliefs about our conscious experiences are false, and as an experimenter, you can actually know things about people's conscious experiences that, that they don't know themselves. On that technical thing, it turns out that when you look at the visual world, you feel like you're seeing the whole thing, all 180 degrees of vision here, in high detail. And it turns out that that's just false. You have, and you, by looking at the structure of the eye, we can tell you that you have good detailed vision in only about two degrees of visual angle. And that's your thumb width at arm's length is about a degree of visual angle. So you have about a thumb. That's all the high resolution vision that you've got. Everything else is actually quite blurry. And that probably is news to you. I'm telling you something about your own conscious experiences that's news to you. Right? That's why I say we're not always the authorities on the nature of our own conscious experiences. You have only one thumb at arm's width, high resolution. The reason you couldn't see that engine is you didn't put your thumb on the engine. So you're putting your thumb all over the place. You think incorrectly that you see, and I'm me too, 
that we see the whole world in high resolution and we don't. So our own introspection about conscious experiences is only authoritative up to a certain point, and then it's not authoritative anymore. We're actually wrong. And that's part of what science, working with conscious you know, spirituality, can actually help us to evolve our own understanding of who we are as conscious beings. It's really important. Where is this experience happening right now? Well, I have the three-dimensional space that I create and the auditorium that I create. And I presume that you have a three-dimensional space and auditorium that you're creating. And even when I talk with you, I'm only talking with my icon of Deepak, right? That, that, that's, right it's, I think the icon <laughs> is talking to the icon. That, 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 that's right. right. And yet, I think there is a meeting of our consciousnesses Correct. as well through the, through the icons. But what I see of you, of course, is, is only a tiny fraction of who you are, and what you see of me is only a tiny fraction. So we have these limiting interfaces, but it's the best we can do. And so I'm, I am interacting with other conscious agents, but through a very, very small interface, which is all that I could muster. Is the fundamental reality whatever that is, at the base of it all, mm -hmm. uh, the ontological primitive, for lack of a better word, mm -hmm. is that even conceivable or imaginable or perceivable? I have to admit the possibility that it's beyond conception. Um, as I said earlier, we don't expect monkeys to have the concepts needed to understand quantum mechanics. And Homo sapiens may not have the concepts needed to understand the fundamental ground of reality. I have to admit that possibility. And it's a real possibility. But as a scientist, that's a bad working hypothesis. <laughs> right? And so what we have but to do... But science is also <laughs> an activity in consciousness. Yes. We cannot explain any experience, leave alone the experience of doing science. Well, we can try. And, and the idea is we can... We can present mathematical models all the time, humbly admitting that we're being precise so that we can see where, where precisely we're wrong and that we're probably wrong. But, but the idea is if we're going to tell stories at all, we might as well tell the stories as precisely as we can so that other people can tell us where we're wrong. Usually we don't like to show ourselves to be wrong. The, Someone else would like to do it for you. So this is the evolution and natural selection of stories. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> And, and, and that's right. And, and by having a rigorous way to kill off bad stories, we can make progress. And, and that's why the... the okay. <laughs> okay, so everyone, just imagine a beautiful sunset on the ocean right now. Everybody having an experience? Where is that experience happening? The experience from the... Well, so I'll, I'll give you the neurobiological, right? Well, so, you tell me the neurobiological right, right, correlates, right? right? Yeah, I can tell the... And, and I'll tell you the, what the, the story that my colleagues would say, that they would say that um, when you imagine something, it turns out the same areas of, say, the visual cortex are activated as when you actually see the thing. If you look at an apple or a sunset, you can use fMRI to find the parts of the but brain that But you just active. told me that there's no such thing as a brain. Right, that's right. So that's why I'm telling you what their, that's their story. And they're going to say that that experience was in the brain and it was perhaps due to the functional properties of the brain or something like that. A construct. I, it's a construct. But I, I'm saying that that can't be right, that, they're, that it's conscious agents themselves have their own field of possible experiences and that's where that experience of the sense it is. The agent itself within its own um, experiential space can have that experience of a sunset. But I take it as a primitive, right, that conscious experiences are a primitive of the theory. Also that free will is a primitive of the theory. Right? And, and that's an important point. Every scientific theory always assumes something and then says, if you grant me those assumptions, then I can explain all these other things. No scientific theory explains everything. You can't. You always have to, so to speak, put your miracles on the table. Here are my miracles. Grant me this. And then, to do good science, you are not allowed ever again to pull in a miracle. I mean, you have to put them on the table first. But if you, those are your assumptions, and then you build everything from that. So my miracles are 
conscious experiences do exist, free will does exist, and that there is a mathematical structure to it. If you grant me those miracles, let's see where we can go, and I think we can go a long way. Do you way. think, and I'm asking this in deep humility, but you're a mathematician and you're not brilliant scientist, um, will ever have a mathematical equation for hope or wonder or bewilderment or curiosity? Well, in or the following sense, I, I think that we will make... <laughs> there's one point that I really want to make on, on this that's really critical. If I give you a mathematical model and even a computer simulation of the weather, and I bring you into the room to show you that, you don't need an umbrella, right? You're not going to get wet. The simulation, the mathematics, is never the territory. And so, and that's going to be the same thing with the theory of consciousness, right? The fact that I'm claiming I can give a mathematical model of consciousness doesn't mean that the mathematics is the consciousness or, or that it even creates consciousness. It's just the model. So the math is never the territory. The mathematical theory of consciousness isn't consciousness. It's not, no. It, it's, it's, it's my model as a conscious my, agent that I'm making, okay. but it itself is not consciousness and does not create consciousness any more than the simulation of the weather creates hurricanes. That being said, I think that as a working hypothesis, I do want to have a mathematical model that can account for hope and fear and all the emotions. We have a good start in evolutionary psychology. Evolutionary psychology does have, for the first time, a logic of emotions that is really quite powerful that can explain why we have the the wide range of emotions that we have, why they don't necessarily act consistently, why we can have contradictory emotions at the same time. It's a very, very powerful theory. And I think that eventually we can math... Actually, part of it is mathematized in the sense that we can use game theory to predict how certain emotional strategies can dominate and others can disappear. So we're making progress on that. But again, that's why I started by saying the math isn't the territory. Just because I have mathematical models that show how emotional strategies can evolve, that doesn't mean that the math is the emotion. Yeah, and maps are very necessary, though, to explore unexplored territories as we extend our maps. Exactly right. Um, semiotics, um, yes. the science of semiotics, yes. um, is this what we're talking about in a way? We are, really, are. It is. Even space and physical objects are semiotics. They're languages that we use to describe a reality that's utterly different. We thought that the language was saying, when I see an apple, that there really is an apple in objective reality. No. The apple is a description, at least from an evolutionary point of view, of fitness payoffs that I might have for taking a bite of it, for example, and so forth. So, uh, we'll pause here and bring on Ricardo, yes. but, you know, I come from, as you know, from a different background altogether. Science is not my forte, even mm -hmm. though I studied biology. Um, in the Vedanta, which is yes. the Indian, um, what you might say, uh, wisdom tradition, they say, um, that which cannot be seen, but without which there is no seeing. Yes. That which yes. cannot be perceived, but without which there is no perception. Yes. That which cannot be conceptualized or imagined, but without which there is no concept or imagination. Yes. You are that. That's right. Would you be sympathetic to that? Very, very sympathetic with that. Absolutely. And I'll just say one, one thing in the conscious agent theory is that the basic definition of conscious agent even has no notion of a self. The conscious agents don't even have a self. They're just aware but not self-aware. We actually have to build in a series of conscious agents into a model to, to have a self. We can actually build selves and we're studying how selves evolve. So it's fun. I can, actually, I can see first that the theory is selfless to begin with, but we can then look at how selves evolve and how find out are, why. How are concepts or constructs of cells That's right. yeah. evolve? That's right. Yeah, even myself is just a symbol. My perception of myself. Why? Isn't he great? <laughs> <laughs>